Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In 1819, Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote, I met murder on the way. He had a mask like Castlereagh. Very smooth he looked, yet grim. Seven bloodhounds followed him. All were fat, and well they might be in admirable plight, for one by one and two by two he tossed them human hearts to chew, which from his wide cloak he drew. As Foreign Secretary, Robert Stuart Castlereagh had successfully coordinated European opposition to Napoleon, but at home he'd repressed the reform movement, and popular opinion held him responsible for the Peterloo Massacre of peaceful demonstrators in 1819. Shelley's poem, The Mask of Anarchy, reflected the widespread public outrage and condemnation of the government's role in the massacre. Why did a peaceful and orderly meeting of men, women and children in St Petersfield, Manchester, turn into a bloodbath? How were the stirrings of radicalism in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars dealt with by the British establishment? And what role did the Peterloo Massacre play in bringing about the Great Reform Act of 1832? With me to discuss the Peterloo Massacre are Jeremy Black, Professor of History at the University of Exeter, Sarah Richardson, Senior Lecturer in History at the University of Warwick, and Clive Emsley, Professor of History at the Open University. Jeremy Black, the early 19th century... um, it was a time of great anxiety for the British government and the spectre of dis- and so on. It, we can trace it back. I, I know you historians want to go back to Adam, but let's start with the French Revolution in 1789 and, and kick that off into what we're going to talk about. French Revolution breaks out in 1789. It frightens many uh, members of the British establishment because there is a comparable movement of British radicalism which looks to France for inspiration, though in part that movement is actually indigenous and looks back to earlier British traditions. Britain goes to war with revolutionary France in 1793, and the war goes badly. Um, And in the context of an unsuccessful war, in the context of anxiety about radicalism at home, and indeed in Ireland as well, there's the growing... Um, use of what, according to some commentators, was repression against signs of radicalism. And that, in a way, provides the context, uh, the long context, for Peterloo. So we have the suspension of habeas corpus, we have the Treasonable Practices Act, we have Seditious Meetings Act. I mean, really ferocious suppression of any sort of free speech, any real assembly, any written work. At the same time, to be fair, one has to say the government was terrified that they were going to be invaded by the powerful French, that they, that they were going to be overturned, monarchy wrecked, the whole system was wrecked. So there was a real threat. Not a, We can look back now and say, oh, the Liberals... There was a really serious threat going on there. Oh, yes, there was a really serious threat. And there's also an important point on which historians are very divided. Um, historians are very divided as to the extent to which the government sentiments rested also on a wide springing of, uh, of, of a popular conservatism. I mean, it's not that everybody in the country is radicals and they're being held down by a brutal and oppressive government. Such an, you know, that, that's not the case. There is an important populist radical stream and there's an important populist conservative stream. And both of them actually interact right through the end of the 18th and the early 19th century. That's actually what makes it interesting. Yeah. Sarah Richardson, can you tell us about the ideological impact of the French Revolution? Develop what Jeremy said into works which are around at the time. I'm thinking principally of, say, Thomas Paine's The Rights of Man. The Rights of Man is extremely influential. It really encapsulates this concentration on universal rights, so it ties in with this idea of reform. I think that, whilst Jeremy's right, and some of the traditions of radicalism go back, the emphasis coming out of the Enlightenment and ideas to do with what's happening in France are about universal rights, rights for everybody, rights that don't rely on aristocracy, don't rely on birth, don't rely on income but the rights that you're born with. And this is something that clearly the working class radical movements pick up on. Can you tell us how Thomas Paine... Let's stick with Paine, but you can bring, please bring in other writers. Now, but he's very useful and so important in America and in France as, as, well as, as well as in this country. The idea of rights was in itself... We just, listeners myself, think, well, there you are. But it was a radical idea, wasn't it? it you didn't have power because of privilege. You didn't have power because of divine right. You had right because your rights as a human being born... Were, were by being born given you. That's right, and I think that when you look at it in terms of political rights and civil rights, this is a very radical idea. The British Constitution is really based on property, on the idea that 
interests are represented, that people aren't represented, that numbers aren't represented, that interests are represented. And you are represented virtually by the fact that in Parliament, for example, you have members from across the country who are not necessarily voted in by the whole population, but they are representing that population via their interests. Now, what Tom Paine is... It's a parliament of property and power rather than a parliament of right. people. And Tom Paine is really saying that to sweep that system away, that individuals have rights, that you should be able to participate as a citizen in the country, and voting rights are one aspect of that that should and be recognised. Can we talk a bit about the industrial unrest that preceded the events at Peterloo? Peterloo, 1819, war finishes 1815. The industrial unrest started before that. You have the Luddites and then the blanketeers marching, smashing machines, uh, resenting the fact that machines are taking away their jobs and employing children and women and so on. I mean, anti-industrial revolution turning into political action, especially up in the north. That's right. The Luddite rebellions are very much anti-industrial, some way quite conservative and resisting change but clearly this feeds into the political unrest, the fact that these people have no rights, they're not represented, their interests aren't being represented virtually But we're talking about marches, smashing violence smashing machines, violence, meetings against the acts that have been put in as Jeremy said at the beginning, during the French wars. Lots of violence and the Blanketeers march is important in this context because it's one of the largest protests in the country, around 10,000 people, and it's just a couple of years before Peterloo in 1817. And again, the magistrates send in soldiers to stop this march that the uh, Manchester textile workers are trying to organise a march to London to present a petition to the Prince of Wales, Prince Regent, to ask him to intervene in the economic distresses in the country. OK, Clive Emsley, we've already heard about the uh, Napoleonic Wars and the appetite for radical politics. How were they surviving when Habeas Corpus was suspended, when there were treason acts and so on and so forth? How, are they, how do they keep going? There are restrictions on mass meetings. Uh, it doesn't stop people um, talking. And it, part of the radical movement does appear to go underground, uh, there is an interesting debate amongst historians. I mean, no one is quite agreed on the extent to which uh, English radicalism is almost entirely constitutional and uh, the alternative view is that there is an, an extremely strong underground revolutionary element within English radicalism. So when we're looking at the radical side, we, have, we, we split again now. Yep. We, have, we have the sort of constitutional, which we'll be coming to at Peterloo, because yep. that's, that's it. And then we have the, the real... Rev you, uh, and you, you can, you, it could be suggested that um, there were, before Peterloo, there were a couple of attempts which is what could be called revolution in this country. Oh, yes, and, uh, and those attempts actually go back to the, uh, to the 1790s. Um, uh, there's, there looks to be a group of... of individuals who were working towards a revolution within the country in the late 1790s. In um, 1801, you get the conspiracy of Colonel Despard, who was a, a comrade in arms of Nelson, but is, is executed with several members of the Brigade of Guards for attempting to kill the king, or that was the, that was the story. And then you have uh, no serious revolutionary activity of that sort, but you get Luddism. And Luddism is infected with um, these radical ideas, or would seem in certain areas to be infected with the radical political ideas. And that's an interesting new departure, that you have industrial action um, linked with political ideology. One of the things about Luddism is that the government's response is to send troops... Thousands and thousands of troops are deployed in Nottinghamshire and in the sort of Yorkshire area. So in the absence of a major police force, I mean, this is the pre-age of... We're uh, still of, talking in around our Peterloo time. Aren't oh, yes, just before, just before, yeah. Just I mean, in the, right. I mean the, you know, the, they are deploying thousands of troops against um, what appears to be this um, working-class movement which um, has, a, had a, has a political tinge which they don't understand. Yeah. Let's... let's get Anna Mouton uh, to uh, the Peterloo. Sarah, uh, it's uh, called by the Manchester Patriotic Union Society. Now, given what happened, given it was became thought of by some as a terrible... They, the Manchester Patriotic Union Society called this meeting, and at the end of their meetings, they sang Rule Britannia and God Save the Queen, which might surprise somebody thinking this was a bunch of terrible radicals. Um, can you just tell us 
what they were after, this, this, this outfit, the Manchester Patriotic Union Society? Well, they're raising profile. They're trying to get reform on the political agenda. As we've seen, the government it shows no interest in advancing. It's a Tory government. They're not. They're interested in repressing this sort of move. They're not interested in uh, legislating or changing anything. So they're trying to use numbers. They're trying to use peaceful protest, and they're trying to raise consciousness by inviting important speakers like Hunt. Also, John Cartwright, who's another leading radical, to try and spread the message. So it's uh, they're really trying to get reform on the agenda. And they're constitutionalists. They believe in constitutional monarchy. And to get it in particular local context, you have this booming city, massive city of Manchester, with no representation in, representation in Parliament whatsoever. And you have a couple of houses, literally a couple of houses in Wiltshire, which sends up an MP. So this is this is what they're on about. Clive, one of the members of the Manchester Patriotic Union Society who spoke to them was Henry Hunt. Can you tell us something about him? Well, he's not... Um, he doesn't come from Manchester. He's a, a kind of... Um, He's a Wiltshire farmer, a real John Bull character, um, famous for his pugilism. And uh, he's, he's a fantastic speaker um, and can hold a crowd and convince a crowd um, and is a, has a reputation as the finest radical orator in the country. That's the reason why, you know, if you, if you want to get a mass meeting, then you get Orator Hunt with his big white top hat to come and address them. It's a wonderful mixture. I love the fact he's a hunting, shooting, yeah. farming, fishing, John Ball man going to Manchester. I got it wrong, he's in the Magic Patrick. He went there to address them, to address them uh, on what then were thought to be radical, though constitutional issues. Yeah, and, and Hunt is a, a constitutionalist. Um, there are... Uh, there are other radicals. This underground revolutionary element is continuing at, at the same time. And uh, Hunt knows them, but um, and certainly in London, he is involved in a meeting at the end of 1816, which, which leads to uh, serious disorder. Uh, but Hunt actually manages to control the bulk of the crowd while the extremists are all for storming the tower. What about Richard? Sorry, Jeremy, you want to say something? Yeah, Hunt's part of a tradition, Burdett before him, Cartwright before him, of, 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 of radicals who want to work within the system to reform it, and who, many of whom are very strong in the North. I mean, it's no accident that the major reforming movement of the 1780s is the Yorkshire Association. Mm -hmm. The North of England has a very powerful reforming but constitutional reforming tradition. So they called this meeting, uh, Sarah Richardson. Uh, they cleared it with the magistrates. They were going to be in St Petersfield. We're told that up to 50,000 people turned up. There were masses of eyewitnesses. It was massively reported. Uh, they got there on the day in their best clothes, as we understand, which is a fact. Which is a factor because um, this is a celebration, and they were told no weapons and so on. So they get there in the morning. Can you just tell us through to the speeches and then what happened? Around midday. The square is filling up with people, around 50,000 people by midday and another 10,000 people by an hour later. The magistrates are watching. There are a number of middle-class commentators who are also watching. But it's fair to say that the majority of people, almost all the people in the square, are working class who've come there in the best clothes to listen to the speakers peacefully. There's no real sign of disorder. So around 20 past one, the speakers arrive and take, there's a platform at one end. They're taken towards the platform in order to begin their speeches about 1.30. This is Hunt with his white top hat and Carlisle, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the other people is a member of the Manchester Female Patriotic Union called Mary Files, which is a female reform movement that's set up. There's a number of these around the country, so women are important as participants in the crowd, but also as speakers. She's on the platform with Hunt and Carlisle and a number of other leading Manchester radicals. And the press, they're there, the Times has sent its reporter, the local press are there, so they're also in the square. So the speakers arrive. The magistrates then decide that Manchester is in great danger and there's going to be disorder, so they decide to send the police in to arrest the speakers. The police turn to the magistrates and say, we can't go in unaccompanied, we need soldiers. So you have the Manchester and Salford Yeomanry who've been set up, I think, after the Blanketeer protests. The Manchesters wanted their own local militia, partly, as Jeremy said, because there's no police force, so therefore they want their own militia in order to control so disorder. So these are chaps on horses with sabres? On horses with sabres. Yeah. And then there's sort of regular army hussars back as well around there, backing them up. Yeah. So they send the soldiers in, 
the crowd resist, try and stop them getting the platform, link arms. And that's when they get the sabres out, the horses out, and basically slash down the crowd and kill a number of people. Official estimates say 11, but... Well, this new book here that I have before me, <laughs> uh, which just came out by Michael Bush, says they've done... The, the sums are going in at 17 and over, eight, over 600 uh, wounded. I think that... That's entirely believable. <laughs> um, Clive Emsley, you've got the Yeoman Cavalry going. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And what was their relationship with the Hussars, the regimental cavalry that backed them up, these men who had fought at Waterloo? Actually, some of the people who were killed had, been, had fought at Waterloo as well, because it becomes very complicated. But just yes. tell us a bit about the Yeomanry, and then what part did the Hussars play? Please? Well, in fact, sending the Yeomanry in was, was probably the biggest mistake, because the Yeomanry were... Uh, generally speaking, mill owners or the sons of mill owners or farmers or the sons of farmers. These were, these were local volunteers uh, who trained well, once a month or whatever. Um, and this is, this is almost a kind of uh, manifestation of class war because these are uh, people who employ the, uh, the individuals in the crowd. Um, and so sending those individuals into the crowd who are not as well trained by any stretch of the imagination as the regular cavalry um, with the potential for this class hostility was an astonishingly stupid thing to do. One thing that I think we should record, because I thought it was very interesting, the hussars, the professionals, the regiment, deeply disapproved of what the yeomanry did. Oh, yes, and, and there are one of the... Um, Hussar's lieutenants, Lieutenant Jolliffe, wrote an account uh, in which he describes, and indeed the Times uh, reporter, describes the yeomanry cavalry cheerfully sabering people um, and uh, the regular cavalry being ordered not to do that, specifically not to do that. I mean, the, there's also the problem of when you... The physical problem for the soldiers of sitting on a horse in a very dense crowd, uh, and the, the, certainly the regulars were told to use the flat of their blades. So they're having to control their horses with their left hand and twist their wrist, given the, the uh, structure of a sabre grip, uh, twist their wrists to bring down the flat of the blade. Now, even bringing down the flat of the blade means that an edge can slice an ear or... or whatever, but an extremely difficult thing to do, um, even for a, a good swordsman on a horse. Excellent. Now then, Jeremy, let's get... You mentioned the journalists were there, good, and they were arrested, and uh, rather surprising... Well, not surprising. The journalist from The Times was arrested. That wasn't surprising. What was surprising that the editor of The Times... Um, went through the roof yes. and insisted on publishing everything he could about how black a day it was, yes. and this was very influential. Can you yes. talk us through uh, that? One of the things that's worth remind, remembering is that there isn't such a thing as a conservative establishment in which everybody has the same opinion. I mean, the, cons the Times is a conservative newspaper, but it is equally horrified by what is going on, um, as, as a lot of reformers are. The newspapers reported it fully. They brought home to a national and, indeed, international audience, because people abroad were able to understand what had happened by reading the London newspapers, something that had happened in the provinces. And again, this is a relatively new de development. In essence, in the 18th century, the reporting in the London press, in the national press, of what happened in the provinces was generally quite small, quite modest. Um, by having reporters actually physically there, and the, you know, these are early days for having newspaper reporters. Most newspapers in the late 18th century had no reporters. They essentially just used cut and paste, taking reports from other newspapers elsewhere by actually sending reporters, by actually then, when their reporters got arrested, taking local Manchester Press the reports... The Times reporter got arrested. Got arrested, yeah. and they, so they then took Manchester Press reports and published them through the London press. They made... I mean, Peterloo, anyway, was very important, but they made it an incredibly totemic moment uh, through, through, through the newspapers. Mm. Did the reporting, as it was done, stir up a body of opinion, then, which, which, which had an importance? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, um... It, for one thing, it, it provokes uh, extremist radicals. It also uh, it, it embarrasses a lot of the, uh, the conservative establishment. Um, and I, th I think the government is probably in a bit of a quandary. I mean, what, 
what can we really do about this? We're scared about the potential of um, some form of insurrection, some extreme radicalism, but we can't start criticising our magistrates or, or prosecuting uh, our magistrates. And so the government is in a bit of a, a, a cleft stick here. But there's also a very serious impact on the... Um, well, even on members of the Manchester Yeomanry Cavalry. Um, less than ten years after uh, leading the cavalry, uh, the Manchester Yeomanry Cavalry, a cotton manufacturer called H.H. H. Burley is actually calling for parliamentary reform at a mass meeting in Manchester, uh, which is a, an interesting vault for us. The, uh, but in a sense, the government, if we're looking at it terribly crudely, and I do apologise, won Henry Hunt, the great speaker in the white top hat, John Bull, two and a half years in prison. Richard Carlyle, newspaper man, six years in prison. His wife kept on uh, publishing his paper. She's put in prison while pregnant for, uh, as pre for two and a half years. His sister's, uh, she's put in prison for two and a half years. Uh, so in that sense, the clampdown continues. Uh, Carlyle manages to use his trial to get around the suppression of the press because trials were published, and therefore there's a further... Um, um, inflammation of public opinion for his track. Tell us about that, sir. Well, Carlyle's interesting because he actually escapes. He's one of the few people who escapes from Peterloo from the square and manages to get to London. He's harboured by local radicals and then, then, then he gets to London and publishes an account in his own newspaper. He gets six years, as you say, where Henry Hunt gets two and a half because he is prosecuted for publishing seditious libel and so therefore seditious um, libel being the account of the meeting yeah and, yeah. and uh, insurrectionary words and so on yeah. but his trial is an incredibly important piece of political theatre I think because one of the things he does in his trial for example is read out Tom Paine's Age of Reason because trials can be reported verbatim and mm. where you cannot publish um, accounts of Peter Lou without being chucked in prison or arrested Although the Times did, I mean they were too powerful to chuck in prison <laughs> <laughs> Lots of journalists are arrested at this time, yeah, and it's, uh, there's a, a lot of censorship. And, uh, yeah, the, the government introduced uh, six acts after Peterloo in order to um, further to repress the press. Yes, we must say that as well. Six further acts of repression were introduced as a result of Peterloo. Yeah, yeah. partly it's for seditious words, but also to increase the tax on newspapers to try and tax them out of existence. So you're driving the radical press underground. Quickly, uh, Jeremy... Uh, I started this programme with yeah. the couple of stanzas from a very long poem by Shelley. He's over in Italy, is it? Yes, in Italy, Italy, and he gets word of it, and he w literally wakes up and dashes it off. Yes. It's, he writes it in 1819, but it's censored until 1832. But did it have any effect? Is he engaging at, at yet another constituency with this, presumably, it was yes. passed around... Uh, uh, very much uh, so. I mean, sort of romantic opinion, fashionable opinion is helped by by responses such as Shelley's to feel that the government system in some way is corrupt. I mean, in practical terms, um, there, are, there are very serious issues in British society. I mean, how do you manage economic difficulties? How do you manage political change? And sometimes the emotional response isn't always appropriate. But there is no other real response to Peterloo than an emotional response because it was such an appalling mishandling of a situation. Um, and, I, I mean, looking forward, um, the, the climate of opinion helps to make it very, very difficult um, to, uh, do, to, to defend what increasingly to many people seems in, indefensible, which is the political system, which is the representational system. But that's a slower burn, Jeremy. That's a slower what burn, happens yes. in the aftermath of Peter Do, if you look at... I mean, you tell me, you three historians, I've just read a bit of stuff, is that actually the government gets its way. I oh, mean, yes. people say, oh, sorry, oh, dear, oh, dear, but there are six acts. Oh, yes. Come in, so the government is helping. Tax the yep. newspapers out of existence. Absolutely no more meetings whatsoever. Uh, tying everybody's hands. And then, and, and it isn't as if Peter lose the end of something. It could be said at the beginning of something, because a year later we have the Cato Street conspiracy. Yep. Just tell us why that was important, Clive. Um, Hunt goes back to London, and there is an enormous. Um, uh, celebratory welcome for him. And, and the extremists with, with whom he'd had these um, uh, slight links in 1816 and 1817, uh, who went under the name of the Society of Spencian Philanthropists, they followed a kind of um, 
proto-communist uh, Newcastle schoolmaster called Tom Spence, who felt everyone should get back to the land and we should stop all of this industrialisation and there should be equality. Um, then there are three principal leaders, Dr Watson and his son and a former militia officer called Arthur Thistlewood. And um, these people have already attempted at least one coup d'etat and uh, they, after Peterloo, they are incensed and say something must be done. So what do they do? They plot to kill the cabinet at a cabinet dinner. Why did it take so long then? Everybody thinks Peter Lomas got re reform, but it's 13 years yes. before there's reform, which actually comes in with the things the government's still very much in charge. Whigs are an absolutely rotten opposition. Tories got Wellington there, great icon, uh, despite how much he might have been disliked. So very quickly, Jeremy, sorry about this, we'll have to do this bit again some other time. <laughs> why did it take so long to get to the Great Reform Act? It wasn't all that great anyway when you think about it, but still, why did it take so long? Why did it take so long is because, first of all, there's an important Conservative population side which we haven't talked about. Second of all because the, the radicals and the reformers are divided and third of all because what, what historians need to do is to look at process as well as structure. Structure demands change as it were but the process of getting change is much much more complicated. Incidentally it leads to a whole lot of big riots. Peterloo was not a riot. The, the riot was by the yeomanry. The riot was actually by the yeomanry. But there are big riots in the 1830s in Bristol and in Nottingham by pro-reformers. And that is very interesting because the relationship there between popular activism and the demand for political change is a complex one. Sarah? I think that you can't get change without a government that's going to introduce change. And the basic fact is the Whigs are not in power. They're the only party that is going to um, embrace any sort of change. And so that is the straight answer why you don't get reform until the and 1830s. Sorry, Jeremy mentioned the phrase conservative populism, Clive. Can you just amplify that into two paragraphs? Um, yes, I mean, it links with the notion of the freeborn Englishman and the idea of the, uh, the English constitution still being, generally speaking, superior, and the English being superior to everybody in Europe. So that is, you think that conservative populism slowed it down? A bit. I think conservative populism slows it down. I think Sarah's absolutely right. Whigs not in power, Tories aren't going to introduce it. No two ways about it. Yeah. And as you say, 1832 is not, I mean, you know, people think of it in the late 19th century as a great reform act. The practicality is that most people, most males still don't have the vote. Women, of course, don't have the vote. And it's only some parliamentary boroughs uh, that get the vote, though Manchester crucially does. And the interesting thing, of course, is an enormous number of males lose the vote in 1832, which is something which is conveniently forgotten very often in the notion of a progressive linear development in the, the vote in, in uh, British society. Well, thanks very much for being such good sports. I was sorry about that stampede. There you go, now and then. Sarah Richardson, Clive Amsley and Jeremy Black, thank you very much indeed. And next week we will be talking about heaven. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.